Okay, uh, so I thought uh, we're going to finish off this section 3.1. I just thought I'd find out if anybody had any questions for me on the stuff we were doing last time on the incompleteness of the continuous functions with, for example, the L1 norm. That's one of the things we looked at. Or if not, then we were looking at uh, the once continuously differentiable functions and I'm pointing out that if you try to use the uniform norm on the once continuously differentiable functions, um, so that's continuous functions which are differentiable and whose derivative is continuous, uh, I noticed if we use the uniform norm on that, then you got something that wasn't complete. Um, equivalently, it wasn't a closed subset of all of the continuous functions with uniform norm. We know that that one is complete, um, so a subset's going to be closed if and only if it's complete with the subspace metric. So we found a sequence in this subspace that converged to something outside. Any questions about that example? I've got a question for you. In second year modules, uh, in the second year module, when one talks about differentiability, one tends to talk about differentiability on open intervals. And here I'm talking about a function being differentiable on the closed interval. So what does that mean at the endpoints? Can you talk about differentiability at the endpoints of a closed interval? Okay, so uh, yes. Okay, so this is in fact an interesting question. Okay, so it is possible. Uh, so, for example, consider the function square root of x. You have to decide whether that function is in this space or not. Now, on the open interval square root has got a perfectly good derivative, um, a half x to the minus a half, right? But that doesn't have a continuous extension um, to the whole closed interval. So that's not going to be suitable for us. So, so it won't be enough to say that it's differentiable in the open interval. So we need... I, would, I think there are two different alternative strategies here. <laughs> what people usually do is they say, okay, it's a usual notion of differentiability on the open interval, and at the end points, where you've only got one direction to come in from, you insist on there being one-sided derivatives, which means you look at the limiting quotients, again, approaching through points of the interval, which at the end points of the interval will be one-sided. Um, so, so there is an issue. Um, we mean one-sided derivative at the endpoints. Because the functions don't even have to be defined on the other side. For example, square root of x isn't defined for negative x. Um, so if you're investigating square root of x, well, you discover it isn't in this space, but it wouldn't be because it wasn't defined for negative values. It would be because um, your limiting quotients blow up to infinity at the origin. So, so in this case, uh, your example, 
That's right. So when you're looking at zero, you will look at the limiting gradients approaching from the right-hand side. And when you're looking at the point one, you'll look at the limiting ratios and gradients as you come in from the left-hand side. In this case, it would be infinite, and that wouldn't count, because it's supposed to have a finite limit. So square root of x wouldn't be in our space, because it's supposed to have a derivative which is in the continuous real-valued functions, in this case. Uh, well, OK, so it's supposed to be once continuously differentiable. But that function square root of x isn't even differentiable at the origin, because differentiable means you've got a, a finite limit of quotients, giving you a real value here. Yeah, that makes sense. OK, so there was an issue there, which uh, was worth thinking about. Uh, right, so we looked then at some functions that were continuous but not differentiable, and a sequence of functions in here, in this once continuously differentiable space, which converged uniformly to something that wasn't differentiable anymore. which we did in a couple of different ways. And then I finished by saying, uh, uh, I said that if you put this norm on the once continuously differentiable functions, then it becomes a Banach space. But I'm not going to prove that for you. I'm going to leave that as an exercise. And I'm going to leave this lemma as an exercise as well. So how does it work? This is what I was discussing at the end last time. If you've got a, a sequence of functions who's uh, in this space, and the derivatives converge uniformly to something, and the functions converge uniformly to something, then you have to prove that the limit of the sequence of functions is differentiable with the correct derivative. Um, there are various, in, in stranger settings, various strange things can happen. Like, it can be that the limit function is differentiable, but the derivative isn't the limit of the derivatives. Um, so, so you do have to watch out for things like that. But in this particular setting, the unit interval is a very nice setting to work on, and you're OK. So I shall leave that as an exercise. So I'm leaving the rest of, it, of, I'm leaving the rest of this section as an exercise. Fill in all the remaining details. So you have to prove this lemma and then use that lemma to prove that uh, C1 and 0 1 is complete with the norm I claimed. And that will give us a chance to get on with uh, section 3.2. But uh, then that final tricky exercise, which is another bare category theorem argument, and we'll come back to that in, again in the next section. So you can have a go at it now. And you're allowed to assume, in doing that, that finite dimensional norm spaces are complete. And we'll come back and, and see how you do this tricky exercise in, uh, in the next section, if you haven't already done it. Any final questions on, on the material in section 3.1? OK, let's move on to 3.2. So I shall stop the recording at this point. <coughs>